Wow! Just wow! That was my reaction when I first watched the Kickstarter video about ERA 1, a game from the developers of Homeworld's famed Complex mod. This project they are working on is their own new game and in the Unreal Engine no less. It is about giving players absolute control over how they want to construct massive spacecraft, space stations and even space cities from many different modules. If their Kickstarter is successful, link to which you can find in the description, the developers, led by Agostino Bocci, apologies for probable mispronunciation, want to publish the first game build by September 2023. So what exactly would you be supporting here? In essence, as the developers put it, Era 1 is a spaceship builder and survival game in an RTS environment. Your aim in the game is to adapt and survive in order to resist an increasingly challenging enemy. I personally can't believe what a resurgence for space RTS games this is. First Homeworld Remastered, then Homeworld 3, then Ephemeris. If you have never heard about that one before, you can find a link to it up here and below. And now, Era 1. So being a fan of Homeworld since the first time I launched my mothership in Homeworld 1 back in 2000, this is insanely exhilarating. I personally view Homeworld as a true masterpiece of this genre and PC gaming in general, but it saddens me that it hasn't been topped in over 20 years. Is it because those developers set the bar too high? Or is it that no capable developers have tangled with this kind of a game up to now? Or do we just wear our glasses set to pink too much? I don't know which one of these is it, or maybe a bit of all of them, but I really, really hope this game finally moves the whole subgenre up one more notch. If you have played Homeworld or any similar Space RTS game, you'll be familiar with the basic concept in Era 1. The mining and collection of resources, defense of your base and fleet management are the most basic gameplay elements. Resources primarily come from asteroids and are extracted by collectors, which deliver them back to your base. But in this game, they can also be self-produced by a module called Fusion at a later, more advanced game level. The player also has to worry about storing access resources they collect. All this will lead to the construction of modules for storage, but also for unloading, increasing the need for such modules. You can create specific ships for the collection and storage of resources or simply enlarge your main ship or base. This is why there will be various types of modules, each with a specific function. The different basic modules will only be used to create the ship's structure or to decorate it and make it unique, while dedicated modules will be used for loading, unloading and storage of resources and production of energy. Next are hangar modules for the production of ships, from fighters and cruisers all the way to battleships, as well as ability modules which will grant your fleet certain abilities or bonuses, usually within a certain spherical radius of the module in question. Then there will be modules for population management and various offensive and defensive weaponry and subsystems. In ERA 1 you can also build modules that will conduct research, allowing the development of new tech. When these modules are connected to each other, they give higher research speed. Each new module also opens another research queue, so players can manage the development of multiple technologies at the same time. In a way, production and research are very similar to what we had in Homeworld, but with a few twists and turns. Assembling all these modules together will be possible in 3D, watching it all as your idea takes shape. The biggest vessels are used as motherships to produce fighters and corvettes, store energy and resources, and are heavily armed and equipped with powerful engines. Era 1 will feature an actual population and it will have several functions, something that Homeworld games only hinted at in their gameplay but never really used it beyond a limiting factor. A large population allows you to build ships and shoot weapons faster and even to passively produce resources. But the higher the population, the more accommodation is required, so when the limit is reached, it is necessary to build new accommodation modules, often by first enlarging the main ship or base. Players can lose population in engagements with the enemy, so it is necessary to protect them. And if you do lose a lot of your population, your options for advancement and construction will be limited. 
to grow the population back, it will be necessary to have a well defended base and to keep your enemies at a distance, especially because a base under attack will not be able to increase its population. Now for some more info about the modules at the heart of the game. Almost all modules consume energy, especially weapons, shields and engines. This is why you must first build energy generators to increase the supply of it. And if connected together, the generators produce more energy, a kind of synergy, just like with the research modules. So it is beneficial to construct large energy production centers, but this creates a tactical weak point. Because if destroyed, the resulting explosion of all those connected generators will damage all surrounding structures. In case you do not have enough energy, you will start to have shortages and problems. Weapons will lose effectiveness and even shut down. Shields will fizzle out. Sensor detection range will decrease and all your industrial modules will slowly shut down. This reminds me of a similar system of energy management in another brilliant space RTS, Nexus the Jupiter Incident. You could customize your ships between battles, but if you didn't supply your energy weapons with enough generators, you couldn't fire them continuously enough to break down enemy shields. Man, what a game that was. I seriously recommend you play it if you haven't already. Anyway, the space bases I mentioned can grow to immense size, because the developers want to remove as many limits as possible for their players in Era 1. The design of these bases is such that they are static, so no energy is used by the engines, but rather for the support of the population and fleet. Now a bit more about the in-game technology. Research of tech requires time and resources, and it is developed on three separate branches – technologies, upgrades and skills. Technologies grant you access to new ships, subsystems and weapon systems. Upgrades allow increasing resource gathering speed, weaponry rate of fire, range and damage, shield strength, research speed and so on. The skills are designed for individual ships in your fleet. For example, the ability to use a certain type of a shield or weapon you have unlocked. A player who has managed to reach a high level of research and climb the tech tree will be highly advanced and able to defend himself or fight the enemy with advanced shields and weapons. They can also produce resources independently, the fusion resource generation I mentioned before, or go inside nebulae and even use cloaking technology to make their ships invisible. More on this later. There are also level ups for the player. Experience is gained from the level of technology, time spent in battle, as well as number of ships built and resources collected. The higher the player's level, the more things they can unlock, which gives them access to exclusive technologies and modules, including decorative and customizable ones. In this way, the player is encouraged to seek the enemy and engage, to gain experience and progress within the game. You will even be able to create templates of these decorations and save them so they can be built on new ships. I want to talk now more about the resources in Era 1. The asteroids are the primary resource, but not the only one. Specialized ships, collectors, extract resources from asteroids and then transport them to the nearest point of delivery. These asteroids are usually arranged in groups, which means several collectors can work on them at one time. The player will also be able to destroy asteroids, thereby generating debris, which can be collected faster, but doing this will reduce the resource yield. And this I think will add a whole additional level to early game harassing of enemy bases and collectors, depending of course on the amount of firepower needed to break the asteroids apart. In Era 1, basically everything that is destroyed leaves behind debris that can later be collected but these do eventually disappear. This means that after you destroy everything in your path, you must be speedy in collecting resources which are now all over the place. Huge dust clouds are also places where resources and debris can be found, but they also offer great ambush points. This is because you can hide from enemy sensors in them and launch surprise attacks. Another place resources can be found are nebulae, highly radioactive nebulae. These contain many hidden resources, however, the radiation level is high and will cause damage and even destruction to all ships that enter it. This is where ships' anti-radiation shields come in as a way to protect your collectors. Something that is unique to this game are megaliths. These are huge structures on the map 
which are remnants of past battles. When conquered, they grant special abilities and undiscovered technologies, but also provide huge improvements to specific characteristics of your fleet. The wrecks of giant ships destroyed during each match will become new megaliths and players will compete to take possession and defend them. I must admit this is a really cool feature as space is empty by its nature and this way players' actions add to it, generating points of interest on the map as they play. Now besides the modular ships and bases, there will be a number of non-modular ones. These are produced in hangars and include utility ships like repair ships, remote probes and sensors, salvaging ships, resource collection ships and mobile refineries. Strikecraft are another type of ships built in hangars and non-modular. These include scouts, interceptors, bombers and corvettes, both light and heavy variants. There are several types of hangars which will produce these ships fighter, corvette and utility hangar. These non-modular ships are used for skirmishing attacks, exploring, patrolling and defending the main base. For defense, there is a complete patrol management system which helps set up zones of control around your main bases. It makes it possible for the player to let the non-modular ships do their jobs, be that combat patrol or repair, on their own. For example, an interceptor must defend several sites at the same time while your repair ship must be able to reach any damaged section unobstructed. In ERA 1, the player can create management and patrol paths based on waypoints that units can follow independently. You can decide the behavior, actions and the time devoted to each waypoint of each craft. Additionally, you will be able to choose which types of ships will automatically follow these paths as soon as they are built, further automating the entire process. But enough about these regular non-modular ships and back to the main point of ERA 1, the modular ones. As I mentioned before, the most important aspect of ship and station design in this game is the freedom to build anything you want as big as you want. It is up to you to choose if you want a ship with a specific purpose or a massive ship which can do many things at once. Build big enough and your base will become an actual floating space city. The construction takes place by first assembling the basic modules that form the superstructure. Then decorative and functional modules are added to give the ship purpose. The main base, as it grows larger, naturally needs more modules. If you build a large structure, it will need many engines to become mobile, and that in turn requires many generators. All those generators cost a lot of resources. This in turn requires modules for resource unloading and storage. And remember, there is also the crew, the ship's or base's population to consider, so add housing modules to your shopping list. Warships are made in a similar fashion, but again, balance of weapons, engines, shields and generators is a must. You will be able to save your favorite configurations and ships through templates. These templates are an important aspect so the player doesn't have to build each ship from scratch manually. You'll be able to save as many templates as you want. A template can be a deadly warship already designed from a previous playthrough or a series of defense turrets dedicated to particular classes of enemies, for example anti-fighter and anti-corvette. But a template can also be just a section of a ship which makes building a new ship or base much faster. There will of course be pre-existing standard templates that simplify things for players ranging from basic ships to more complex ones as well as different size classes, like frigates, cruisers and other capital ships. There are also various control systems in ERA 1, like the ones in Homeworld. Harvest control system, which increases resource collection to any resource collecting ship within range. It also allows progression in resource technologies such as fusion and in harvesting upgrades such as drilling and load rate. The drive system increases the speed and maneuverability of units within its range, including the ship on which it's built. It allows progress in drive technologies such as engines, thrusters and speed upgrades. The defense control system increases damage resistance of units within the range of the module and progress in defense technologies and upgrades. The fire control system, similarly, increases the power and rate of fire of units and progress in attack technologies. The hyperspace generator naturally enables hyperspace jumping to all units within range of the module including the ship that has the module. They then travel across the map quickly at a cost that varies depending on the size of the ship and distance traveled. 
A gravity well generator, as its name suggests, generates a gravitational well within a certain radius that prevents ships from both entering and exiting hyperspace. This prevents surprise close-range attacks, but also prevents a player from jumping their own fleet for the safety of their base. The cloaking system module activates cloaking capabilities to all units within its range. The ship can hide itself and any surrounding ship from enemy sensors. And speaking of sensors, the sensor array significantly improves the distance at which a ship can penetrate the fog of war, improving the detection of nearby enemy ships, and the range can be extended through upgrades. Anti-cloaking, as you can guess, helps detect nearby cloaked enemy ships. The hyperspace sensor has a similar function just for spotting and tracing hyperspace activity on the map. This allows you to track an incoming attack and prepare. Space sonar is an interesting one. It sends a ping across the map to spot enemy ships and remote weapons, but it does not provide real-time tracking, a drawback which is balanced by its ability to cover large distances. Furthermore, that range can be extended through upgrades. The one thing it doesn't show are hidden ships which stay invisible to sonar. Now a bit on the subject of turrets. These are the main type of weapon modules a player can build. They can be offensive or defensive and it is in the mixing of these that you discover what works against which enemies and what fails. As with other modules, weapons consume energy. If a ship has insufficient power available, its weapons lose effectiveness and even shut down. There are quite a few of these, mostly divided between their function, or better said, what they are used against. So for battling against corvettes most efficiently, you will use pulsars, lasers or rockets. But basic cannons and rapid sweepers work too, and also do good damage to fighters. Against missiles, fast tracking turrets are the best, while against capital ships you need plasma turrets or missiles. But even better ones are ion cannon turrets, mine launchers and, as you could expect, nuclear bombs. Then there is a whole class of autonomous weapon systems like modular weapon platforms and remote weapons. The former are basically structures with weak engines but massive weaponry. The latter can cover long distances and they are, for example, Viper missile, roller mine and regular as well as heavy nuclear bomb. I am not sure what is the difference between a regular and a heavy, possible in its yield. In any event, the only way to counter remote weapons like these will be with shields or anti-missile systems. These shields, when activated, protect the ship from any attack and consume vast amounts of energy. Also, each shield generator module generates a shield only within a certain radius. Therefore, players have to build more shield modules to increase the surface and power of a shield. There will be two different types, anti-weapon shields and anti-radiation shields. After going through all this info, screenshots and video clips, I must say that the clarity of vision these developers have is incredible, but also has to be expected as they have been modding Homeworld with these kinds of gameplay mechanics and systems for decades. We should expect no less perfection in the execution of their own new vision on a whole new project like this one, especially since it doesn't play too differently to the game on which they have been practicing their skills for so long. Head developer of this game worked on the remastered version of Homeworld at Gearbox back in 2014 and 2015, and that was after years of modding the original games so his expertise in the field of Space RTS games is unquestionable. I do hope that you have enjoyed this video and will go over to their Kickstarter page to help out with the funding. Or you can help by sharing this video with other potential players or supporters and in doing so spread the word about this game. If you want to learn about more similar upcoming RTS games, I have many video lists and showcases on my channel, some of which are posted here as cards on the screen. Do think about leaving a like and even subscribe and let me wish you happy gaming.